why are some countries rich and other countries poor? I'm uh, and other countries poor. I'm specifically referring to your article regarding uh, Louis C.K.'s evil life. Yeah, so this is the thing where there's surprising consensus among economists. Um, what I'm about to say is not particularly libertarian. This is just the standard economic view, the standard view in development economics. And keep in mind, the average economist and the modal economist is probably a moderate Democrat, like in the U.S. So the standard view, you can read this in Why Nations Fail by Darren Achumoglu and James Robinson. Um, you can see this in a bunch of other things, is that countries are rich because of institutions and countries are poor because of institutions. Or maybe a better way to put it is poverty is the default natural state of human beings and certain institutions guarantee that you'll remain in poverty and certain institutions create cause people to leave poverty. This is Adam Smith's thesis. This is what economists have been largely defending since. Which institutions? It's, you can give a list. Um, having a stable form of governance characterized by the rule of law is incredibly important. Why? Because it allows people to plan long term and it gives them an incentive to invest. If, you, if you're under a capricious rule, you have no incentive to think long term and no incentive to invest because you know that the rulers can mistreat you and take your stuff at any point. Um, having stable private property free of the threat of expropriation. That's incredibly important. The countries that have that are rich. The countries that lack it are poor. Um, having open markets like and free trade, but that's important. So stable governance, private property, strongly protected private property, and open markets, those are the things that lead to prosperity. Every Basically, every country that has those three things is rich. Every country that lacks them is poor. Um, when countries move to having more of these institutions, they become richer. When they start moving away from those institutions, they become poor. That's the standard view in development economics. Um, the thing that a lot of people are taught in high school by historians and unfortunately, historians are generally not social scientists. They're just humanities professors who don't do rigorous data. Um, this, the view that you're taught often in school is that, well, some countries are rich and others are poor because of past colonial expropriation. Um, and it's true that the Western European countries engaged in a lot of colonialism. But whether that made them rich is an empirical question. And actually, if you haven't read Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, it's worth noting that the Wealth of Nations was on this very point. It was an anti-imperialist book. And Smith's argument in that book was, if you look at the value of the raw materials that England gets from its empire, and you compare that to the expenditure, the expenses it has to get to get those raw materials, the tax expenses, the military intervention, what you find is that you're, you're spending more to get those raw materials than the value of the raw materials themselves. You know, be like the kind of thing where imagine I try to mug you and I rob you of $50, but in order to rob you of $50, I had to buy a $500 handgun. Well, I lose. I'm actually losing money. And so Smith says, if you carefully calculate this out, what you find is empires are losing money. And in fact, he's right about that. We have more data than he does. There's this nice book from the 80s called Man and an Empire, which calculates this out. And they're like, yep, Smith's right. Empires lose money. So why does it happen? It's a story of concentrated benefits and diffuse cost. A small number of politically well-connected people, the East India Company, certain arms manufacturers, the king himself, they benefit from empire. And the cost of empire are are diffused among the masses who have to pay for the taxes. They get some raw materials, but the raw materials they get back are, are less valuable than the taxes they paid to get them. So imperialism is not the explanation for why some countries are rich and others are poor. It's not um, because of resources. In general, countries with good resources tend to, have bad, tend to be pretty poor and <laughs> have bad governance. And countries with good resources or bad resources tend to be richer. Um, economists actually call this the resource curse. You can Google that. Norway might be the... Norway might be the one uh, exception to this. And the thought is that if you have stable, res like lots and lots of resources, what tends to happen is politically powerful people will create a bad governance system that allows them to extract the value of those resources. And so you will not have the protection of private property. You won't have a uh, government characterized by the rule of law. Um, in contrast, like the countries that have bad resources <laughs> tend to have to develop sort of by necessity good institutions, and then their ones become rich. So Adam Smith noticed this too. He's like, the Netherlands and England are, are rich and France and Spain are relatively poor. Why is that? France and Spain have way better resources than the Netherlands. The Netherlands is like underwater and England doesn't have that much stuff either. During the Cold War, you can see this. Uh, you know, the United States has worse resources than the USSR, but it's much richer. Uh, Hong Kong is much richer than mainland China per capita, even though mainland China has awesome resources and Hong Kong is a bunch of rocks. You know, Singapore is rich compared to say the areas around it, but it's not because it has more resources. South Korea is richer than North Korea, even though North Korea has slightly better resources. 
Uh, in general, it's resources don't explain it. It's institutions. Um, do you have stable governance characterized by the rule of law, um, uh, open markets, and the robust protection of private property? What makes wages rise? The buyers do not pay for the toil and trouble the worker took, nor for the length of time he spent in working. They pay for the products. The better the tools are, which the worker uses in his job, the more he can perform in an hour, the higher is, consequently, his remuneration. What makes wages rise and renders the material conditions of the wage earners more satisfactory is improvement in the technological equipment. American wages are higher than wages in other countries because the capital invested per head of the worker is greater, and the plants are thereby in the position to use the most efficient tools and machines. What is called the American way of life is the result of the fact that the United States has put fewer obstacles in the way of saving and capital accumulation than other nations. The economic backwardness of such countries as India consists precisely in the fact that their policies hinder both of the accumulation of domestic capital and the investment of foreign capital. As the capital required is lacking, the Indian enterprises are prevented from employing sufficient quantities of modern equipment, are therefore producing much less per man hour, and can only afford to pay wage rates which, compared with American wage rates, appear as shockingly low. There is only one way that leads to an improvement of the standard of living for the wage-earning masses, viz. the increase in amount of capital invested. All other methods, however popular they may be, are not only futile, but are actually detrimental to the well-being of those they allegedly want to benefit.